Welcome to my coronavirus class. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is Nervous Tissue. So, to begin, I would like to address the bones and the muscles of the day. I've had a couple emails and a couple inquiries about why we are doing this and whether or not you're going to be tested on it. And it will not be a part of your like four points tests, but it could be extra credit opportunities that are available between now and the uh, fourth exam. So, um, is it your fourth exam? Your bones and muscle exam. Um, yeah, I think it's the fourth one. So, there are a lot of bones, 206 bones that you have to memorize. And there are a lot of muscles. There are hundreds and hundreds of muscles. I think you only have to know like 50 or 60 or so, something like that. But it's still a lot, and this is a fast class. So if you get to the end of the semester in muscles and bones and think that you're just gonna be able to memorize them all right then in those like two weeks that we have for those two systems, you're wrong. And if you think that when we get to muscles and bones, I'm going to go back over the bones and muscles that I've taught you already as bones and muscles of the day, you are also wrong. So when we get to the skeleton, and that we're going to talk, I'm going to talk to you a lot about uh, skeletal tissue in chapter six. In chapter seven for the skeleton, I will maybe address the bones that we don't talk about as bones and muscles of the day. Well, I will. Like I'll talk about how the um, thoracic cage comes together, the ribs and the sternum, uh, and how they articulate and things like that. But I'm not going to go over the humerus again. I'm not going to go over the radius and ulna again. I'm not going to go over the hand again. So just be aware of that. Um, you're expected to be in class the entire time. So this is how it would have been on campus. This is how it is in your living room or wherever it is that you're working from. So we're just gonna go with it. And so if you fast forward through muscle meditations and all of that, that's absolutely okay. Just please make a note card and start memorizing these bones and muscles now. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed at the end of the semester and you will. And if you sometimes like that overwhelmed, like for me, when I get overwhelmed, I get angry. And so I might go to my teacher and get angry. And I don't want you to be angry at, the end, at me at the end of the semester because it, it won't work. I'll say, but we've been doing this all along and you should have been memorizing them all along. So you got to know them now. So know them now. All right. So on that note, let's look at our bones and muscles for the day. This is going to get us out of our, uh, in bones anyway, it's going to get us out of our upper limb. So we learned uh, the humerus the first day in class, then we learned the ra which is the, muscle, the long bone of your arm. Then we learned the radius and ulna, which are the long bone, bones of your forearm. Then we learned the pectoral girdle that holds your arm to, or your upper limb to your thorax. Now we're gonna learn the hand. So uh, you actually are lucky. You don't have to memorize the names of all of these little tiny bones down here. These, what you'll see, you need to know for the hands, bones in groups the carpals, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. So what's nice, this is what's kind of cool, is that even though there are 206 bones in the body, you don't have to really memorize everyone because a bunch of them you're gonna be able to group together like so. So all of these bones right here are your carpals. These are the bones of your wrist. So if you were to look at a skeleton or a picture of a skeleton or a model or whatever, and a label was here and it said, what is this? You would say, it's a carpal. Okay, then these ones are your metacarpals. So your metacarpals, that's why if you noted when you were learning all of your body regions, the back of your hand on the posterior aspect was called the metacarpal region. It's because these are your metacarpals. The anterior aspect of your hand is your palmar region. That's because that's your palm. So sure, yeah, your metacarpals are under there. But uh, how we number or name our metacarpals is we give them a Roman numeral and the Roman numeral one, which is an I, goes for the metacarpal that goes to your thumb. Does anybody remember? what the special name for your thumb is. I hope you do. It's the pollux. So your pollux is near your palm. Your hallux is near, near your heel. Just remember it that way. Okay, so this first metacarpal is metacarpal one. And then this second metacarpal is metacarpal 
uh, two, but these are Roman numerals, not numbers, okay? So then the one that goes to your middle finger is I, I, I. The one that goes to your ring finger is uh, I, V. And then the one that goes to your pinky finger is V. Those are your metacarpals, okay? And then you have digits that are numbered accordingly, numeraled accordingly. And then, so these digits are made of bones called phalanges. And what you'll notice about, okay, so let me actually show you these things up close. Here are your carpals. Here is your pollux. Here is metacarpal I, metacarpal II, metacarpal III, metacarpal IV, metacarpal V. Okay, so <laughs> those are your metacarpals, one through five, but Roman numeraled. And then we have our digits, and their digits have phalanges. These are uh, the, thing, the bones that make up our fingers and our thumb, or your digits and your pollux. And what you'll note is that your fingers can move more than your thumb can, and your thumb can only move like thusly because it only has a proximal and a distal phalange. So this one's proximal, closer to the point of attachment. This one's distal, further from the part of attachment. Then if we look at all of our other digits, they have proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. So we have a little bit more flexibility in those fingers because we have an extra joint. So this is proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal, phalanges that make up the digits, and that is your hand, which I know is more than one bone, but it's one set of bones to memorize for the day. Okay, muscles. Last time we talked about the pectoral girdle, which is what holds your upper limb to your thorax. And what's cool about your upper limb is it's super flexible, but it's not very stable because you have to trade that. So instead like of having a bone locked into a bone that we'll see in the pelvic girdle, we have a bone kind of held into this other arrangement with a whole bunch of muscles that make up what's called the rotator cuff. So we're actually gonna memorize uh, four muscles today. We'll only breathe through each of them two times. The reason that I go through it so many times is because everything Everything that I do is based on brains and how they learn. So make note of that. It may seem ridiculous to you or redundant, but they say if you do something seven times, you become a master. So if you memorize, if you do a muscle meditation seven times, in theory, you can master that. So hopefully if you did the muscle meditation last class for deltoid seven times, you know that it flexes, abducts, and extends your arm. So these muscles are the ones that are going to hold your uh, humerus into the glenoid cavity and help rotate your arm. They make up your rotator cuff. So first let's talk about some motions really quick and then I'll show you the muscles. And what's cool is that when we talked about the scapula, we talked about, um, we didn't talk about Terry's minor, but we talked about some of these, the fossa that these muscles sit in. So, um, Okay, so the four muscles that are holding your humerus into your pectoral girdle make up the rotator cuff. This is the deltoid that we talked about last time, and I showed it to you on the little muscle man, but I wanted to show it to you on this big muscle because I love it, it's my favorite muscle. Let's do a deltoid challenge. Maybe I'll start doing exercises to see if I can build my deltoids this summer, and we can all, like, all do it together so you can get the biggest deltoids. I don't know if I'm serious. I'm serious. You'll see. <laughs> uh, anyway, pull off that deltoid and we can see the muscles of the rotator cuff. So supraspinatus sits in the supraspinous fossa of the scapula. So here's the spine of the scapula. And so underneath this muscle is the supraspinous fossa, which makes this muscle supraspinatus and it abducts the arm. So abduct, it pulls it away. But we said deltoid did that. 
It does, but to start the motion, supraspinatus is actually going to pull first. It initiates arm abduction, and then deltoid gets in there and finish, finishes the job. It, deltoid's like the prime mover in arm abduction, but supraspinatus gets it going. Infraspinatus sits in the infraspinous fossa. So recall, this is the spine, so this is the infraspinous fossa, and this muscle right here is the infraspinatus. And you're saying, yeah, but it looks like there are a lot of muscles right there. Well, it's true. Th these right here are all infraspinatus. This is Terry's minor. Is that right? Am I looking at this? Yep. And this is Terry's major under here, which is not part of the rotator cuff. So this is infraspinatus right here, and this is Terry's minor right here. And so what you can see here is it says for infraspinatus that it rotates an adduct arm. So if I remove something by abducting it, I add something back by adducting it, or bring it closer to the body or closer to the midline by adducting it. So infraspinatus is going to help with arm adduction. Um, Terry's minor also helps with, um, oh, well, okay, hang on. So let's talk about this. Rotation of the arm. What's rotation? A rotational movement is when you don't change the angle between bones, but you're rotating on the axis. So if I have my arm uh, flexed, my forearm flexed, then I can immediately and laterally rotate my humerus. So I'm not changing the angle between the bones, but I am rotating on the axis. So medial rotation is when you pull toward the midline, and lateral rotation is when you pull away from the midline. And I'm bringing all of that up right now because it's important to be aware of because they're different. And we'll see th this muscle down here is doing the opposite type of rotation than these muscles right here. And these muscles all together are forming the rotator cuff that allows you to do all of the movements in that joint. So supraspinatus initiates arm adduction. What does it mean by infraspinatus rotates and adducts the arm? One thing that I don't think that I mentioned is that muscles always pull. They never push. So if I'm going to be moving anything, the muscle that's doing the movement is pulling on a bone. So if I have a muscle right here, and it's going to pull on my humerus, which way do you suppose it's going to rotate my humerus? Is it going to rotate it medially toward the midline or laterally away from the midline? It's going to pull it and we're going to laterally rotate the arm. So infraspinatus laterally rotates the arm and then you could see if I was abducted if I were to pull this muscle it adds it back it adducts I hope that that's clear in the video okay Terry's minor is go is this one right here just inferior to infraspinatus it's superior to Terry's major and what Terry's minor is going to do is it's also going to help with lateral rotation of the arm but it's also going to help with arm extension so it's a little in, it's inserts a little more inferiorly and so if your arm is uh, flexed it can assist with arm extension and then subscapularis is the last muscle that we haven't talked about uh, of the rotator cuff right here. And I told you Terry's major is under here. That's here. We're ignoring it right now. Subscapularis is right here. And subscapularis, what kind of rotation do you think it does? If muscles always pull, this is going to contract and shorten and pull and medially rotate your humerus. Okay? So. Rotator cuff, supraspinatus abducts arm. It initiates arm abduction. Infraspinatus, laterally rotates and adducts arm. Teres minor, laterally rotates and extends arm. And subscapularis, medially rotates arm. I think, yeah, for all of you who are listening and paying attention to bones and muscles of the day, I'm just gonna tell you right now, if you memorize the origins and insertions of all of your bones and muscles of the day, I'll give you 0.25, a quarter of a point uh, replacement credit on the lab practical. 
so hopefully you're listening to all of this and paying attention and heard that because I don't think I'm going to announce that. Uh, I'm not going to write that anywhere. So changes in class are announced in class. So always come to class. And I'm not going to even mention that again. So rewind if you want to hear it. Let's do our muscle meditation. Okay, close your eyes. Breathe in, supraspinatus. Breathe out, initiates arm abduction. Breathe in, supraspinatus. Breathe out, initiates arm abduction. Breathe in, infraspinatus. And breathe out, adducts and laterally rotates arm. Breathe in, infraspinatus. Breathe out, adducts and laterally rotates arm. Breathe in, teres minor. Breathe out, stems and laterally rotates arm. Breathe in, teres minor. Breathe out, extends and laterally rotates arm. Breathe in, subscapularis. And breathe out, medially rotates arm. Breathe in, subscapularis. And breathe out, medially rotates arm. And breathe in and breathe out and come back to class. All right, so we're quickly going to talk about the general functions of nervous tissue, and then we're gonna talk a lot about the anatomy today, and then we're gonna dive into a lot of physiology next time. So it's gonna feel like a lot of physiology today too, but that's because the anatomy leads to the physiology and you can't really separate the two. So functions of the nervous system. It helps with sensory input. So you'll, like the example I think in the picture in your book is that you see a glass of water and that's the sensory input. So photons of light coming into your eye is, <laughs> or and any kind of sensory input. So we'll say that the nervous system helps to intake sensory information. And this is happening through nerves. So n little sensory receptors detect changes and then communicate that information in nerves, which are uh, parts of the nervous system. So that information will be conducted in sensory nerves back to the central nervous system, which is going to integrate all of the incoming sensory input and decide what to do. So our integration center is going to integrate, we'll say integrates, all incoming information and decides what to do. So in this deciding what to do, it makes a decision and says, okay, I'm going to send out this message so that some change can happen or we take some action, some motor output. So the next thing is that motor output, but there's going to be like this initiation of that. So uh, that's kind of this deciding what to do. So we integrate all of the um, incoming information and decide what to do. And then the nervous system is going to send some motor command through a motor nerve, which is also an organ of the nervous system. And that motor nerve is going to land on some effector and that will respond to that signal and bring about some change. So um, our motor output will say is going to be uh, nerve impulses conducted to effectors will say to bring about change. So what the figure I think in your book has is an eyeball that's like looking at a glass of water. And so the sensory input is actually coming into your eyeball and it's going back to your brain and you're starting to think, man, I'm thirsty. And your brain says, well, you better get your butt off the couch and go get some water. <laughs> so uh, you see like an arm getting a glass of water. So all of that motor output getting you off the couch and going to the kitchen and grabbing your glass of water was a result of a bunch of nerve impulses that went out to muscles and got you doing all the stuff to take a drink. So your nervous system's job is to kind of 
decide to do all that. So things that need to happen quickly like that are controlled by the nervous system. So what are the divisions of the nervous system? You've probably all heard of your central nervous system before. And your central nervous system contains your brain and your spinal cord. So those are the organs of the central nervous system. Brain and spinal cord. So this is where we have our integration occurring. So these are our integration centers. So your brain is going to be the integration center for really complex behaviors. But your spinal cord is also an integration center. Decisions can happen from your spinal cord alone. Like if your doctor taps your patellar tendon, then your spinal cord is going to send out a command that is going to allow for your quadriceps to contract and your knee to jerk and that's going to happen. You didn't think about that, it just happened. I mean sure, you were aware that it happened because some sensory information was going up your spinal cord and into your brain, but you didn't control the execution of that movement. So, okay, awesome. Then everything that is part of the nervous system that's outside of the brain and spinal cord is part of the peripheral nervous system. And so for, if we're thinking about the system, the organs of the peripheral nervous system are the nerves, and your book says also the ganglia. So nerves and ganglia. Uh, this chapter starts with an introduction to the nervous system and the way it's broken down so that we can understand what's happening in nervous tissue as we're conducting all of these action potentials through it. So nerves are going to be these clusters of what are called axons of neurons. And we're going to look at neurons in great detail in a minute. Ganglia are these groups outside the central nervous system where we find a bunch of the somas of neurons, which is the cell body. So ganglia, a ganglion is one. Ganglia is the collective term for these enlarged regions where we're leading out to a nerve where we find all the cell bodies of neurons. So you'll see that in your picture if you're looking at like organs of the peripheral nervous system, ner nerves and ganglia. The cell bodies are the enlarged regions in the ganglia, and then the nerves contain the axons. So what we could say about nerves is that these contain axons of neurons, and ganglia contain somas of neurons. In the peripheral nervous system, outside the nervous system, Inside the nervous system, nerves and, and um, sorry, <coughs> inside the central nervous system, cell bodies and uh, axons run in different structures. <coughs> in the peripheral nervous system, we can further divide it into the divisions that are carrying various types of information. So all of the nerves or neurons that are bringing in sensory information are part of the sensory or the afferent division. So this brings sensory info to the CNS. Uh, so, all right, the sensory afferent division is going to bring information to the CNS. Now this might be information about which you are aware, or it could be information that you have no idea what's going on. So if you're aware of it, it's like somatic. What just happened? I don't even know what I do to myself half the time. Okay, somatic. Somatic, you are aware. Uh, you have special senses too of which you're aware, but like, like running through your body, like from your arms and stuff. Well, we're just going to say sensory information. There's things that you're aware of, um, and then there's things that you are unaware of or visceral. So visceral information is information that you're unaware of. So this is like what's happening in your organs. And sometimes you can be aware of what's going on in your organs, but a lot of times you're not. So for example, you're not paying attention to your blood pH. 
you have no awareness of how many hydrogen ions are floating around in your blood. And that's probably a good thing because sometimes it might be stressful. So you, but your, doesn't mean your brain's not aware and your brain's only aware because it got that message from the sensory division, okay? Of the peripheral nervous system. All right, and then the motor division that's going to bring information back out to the body is the efferent division. And again, we have two branches. The somatic division that you have control over, it's the only thing you have control over, and the autonomic division that you have no control over. Well, I could argue that that's not fully true. But for right now, let's say the motor division is going to bring out um, commands, so it brings out commands, and the effectors are only ever going to be some type of muscle. What types of muscle are there? Skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. So some type of muscle. And glands. So the effectors for just the motor division, I'm not saying somatic yet, just it, the, the, the effectors for bringing out these commands. Who's going to respond to these commands? The effectors. The effectors for the nervous system is some type of muscle or gland. We're going to talk about glands a little bit for exocrine glands of the skin, but we're going to talk a lot more about glands when we get to the endocrine system next semester. So effectors and that the effector that we're going to talk about right now this semester is skeletal muscle so um, <clears throat> just be aware of that so this is kind of the overarching idea of what the nervous system as a whole is doing and in this efferent division there's the somatic division that you have control over so which of all of these effectors do you have control over skeletal muscle right so the somatic division, the only thing you have control over in theory is skeletal muscle, which means that all of these other targets, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, are under the control of the autonomic division, or the ANS. So this is the autonomic division, or autonomic nervous system. And we have a real quick half a test at the end of the semester over this. So a 50 point test at the end of the semester over the autonomic nervous system. And I do it that way because this system controls everything you're gonna talk about next semester. Whether you stay with me or not, everything you're gonna talk about next semester is covered by this. So if you learn this and then say learn special senses, which is the chapter that comes after it in your book, then you're gonna be blown away by special senses. They are gonna blow your mind and you're gonna forget about the autonomic nervous system. But in some regards, the autonomic nervous system is the most important part of 201 for 202. So that's why we do it this way. So I might drive you crazy, but it's for your own good, I promise. Okay. So those are the functions, those are the divisions, somatic nervous system, and the only thing you have control over, autonomic nervous system, we'll talk about it at the end, you do not have control over it. There are two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, a fight or flight division called your sympathetic nervous system, a rest and digest division called your parasympathetic nervous system. We'll talk more about that at the end of the semester. Okay. So in nervous tissue then, that was like nervous system. Let's step away and think about nervous tissue and what types of cells we find in nervous tissue. So the cells, the main functional cells of the nervous system are neurons. And these are going to be the conductive cells that function to transmit impulses throughout the nervous system. Or we'll say that function to transport, um, I think your book calls them nerve impulses. I'm gonna call them action potentials because that's what they are. So there's our conductive cells that function to produce action potentials or nerve impulses.
So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about neurons. And uh, yeah, that's what we're going to spend most of today's lecture talking about. So we'll come back to those in a minute. Neuroglial cells are all of the supporting cells. And they support our neurons. So we've got two di um, different types of neuroglial cells, depending on whether we're talking about the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. But either way, the supporting cells are the neuroglial cells, and they're supporting our neurons because the neurons are the big, important, functional cells of the nervous system. The big, important, functional cells of the nervous system. The function of the nervous system is to conduct electrical impulses around, to bring in sensory input through an electrical impulse, to integrate that, impulse, that information through electrical impulses that are happening in your central nervous system, in your brain and spinal cord. And then those electrical impulses are gonna go back out through motor output. So these are all electrical impulses that are conducting and shooting around your body through these cells. They are phenomenal cells. That's why we're going to spend so much time talking about them. So just be aware of that. The, if I were to ask you what are the, what's the primary functional cell type, it must be a neuron because the function is to conduct these impulses. All right, so the neural glial cells that support our neurons are going to be divided into those that we find in the central nervous system and those that we find in the peripheral nervous system. Those that we find in the central nervous system, the first and most abundant, are called astrocytes. And again, astrocytes, um, well, if, if it's the most abundant, it's probably the most important. And so they get their name because they kind of look like stars. And astrocytes reach these, they, here's their nucleus here, and they reach these like feet around, and they do all sorts of really cool stuff for neurons. Well, that's not a good enough answer for what's the function of an astrocyte. Really cool stuff is not a good enough answer. So what do they do? Well, they support the normal growth and development of our neurons. So how is it possible that we can have brain models that look like the same, but we can have people whose brains are so very obviously different? Why do they all tend to look exactly like this? because astrocytes support this kind of folding of neurons as they're racing forth to grow and divide and fold and fill your skull. So, um, and the reason that they fold in that way is because you have more, like there's just not enough room in there. So they just start folding all over the place so that they can fit, it's awesome. Uh, and our astrocytes are gonna make sure that they do that in like this normal kind of way. Uh, other things that they do. They wrap these little feet around the capillaries in the brain and help to form the blood-brain barrier. So you'll see that we've got capillaries in that picture of your astrocytes and they're wrapping these little feet around these capillaries and that's helping to form the blood-brain barrier. The other thing that helps to form the blood-brain barrier is what type of junctions between the endothelial cells. This could be a test question. Tight junctions. So tight junctions seal plasma membranes together and that's what's going to help to form the other part of the blood-brain barrier. But that's not the astrocyte, that's a fact. We talked about cell junctions in chapter one. We just got done with chapter uh, four in epithelial tissues. Endothelium is a simple squamous epithelial tissue and in our blood-brain barrier, it's sealed by tight junctions. We're bringing all this information together now, people, and it's gonna be great. You're gonna love it. So astrocytes help to form the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> okay, so because of that, they can kind of control what's coming into the uh, extracellular fluid here and out of it. So they can, can the, we'll, we'll just say they help to control the chemical environment. Uh, does anybody remember what we said this fluid was, this extracellular fluid that's in our nervous tissue? Cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so we're going to help to be able to pull stuff 
into and out of the cerebrospinal fluid in the blood to help control the chemical milieu of the um, neurons so that they have everything, all of the ions and things that they need for uh, conducting. What else do these guys do? So the really kind of interesting thing about, it's really super cool, uh, about neurons is that they are actually amitotic in your brain, uh, except for, with the exception of a, a few places, um, very early on. So um, what does this mean? Uh, that as your brain gets better and as you grow, it gets better because you cut off and clip off the neurons that you're not using and you solidify all of the connections that you are using and it kind of happens from the back to the front of the brain which is super cool but what that means then is you have millions of neurons that die over the span of your life and so why is it that if you don't have dementia or Alzheimer's at the end of your life your brain still looks like this because the astrocytes fill the space of dead and dying neurons that's another function so astrocytes fill the space of dead and dying neurons. They help to solidify synapses so that uh, what, when neurons are firing together a lot, astrocytes can wrap around that so that the um, signaling is stronger and they're better. So the more you use it, the, then you, if you use it, you won't lose it. So that's actually what happens at night when you're sleeping. You solidify all these connections between these neurons you're using and the astrocytes can wrap around there and help. So we could also say uh, they support synapses. I mean, they do a lot. They, that's their big, probably most important functions, but they're the most abundant cell. So they are the most important and they're doing a ton of things for the um, uh, neurons. So read about the rest of it in your book. Let's move on. Microglial cells are the next type of cells. Microglial cells are the only local immunity that you have in the central nervous system, well, in the nervous system at all for the ma that matter. The peripheral nervous system just doesn't have any uh, immune cells hanging out in there. What you say, I hope you say what. So microglial cells are these cells that have like these, they look kind of like pokey. I don't know what their legs look like. Uh, but these are phagocytic cells in your central nervous system. So your nerves, your nervous system is actually protected from your immune system by that blood brain barrier, by your nerves. I could have showed you this guy a moment ago. I can, but your nerves coming out of your vertebral column, your nerves are covered in connective tissue and your immune system is used to seeing connective tissue all the time. It's not used to seeing neurons. So if you actually nick a nerve, then you're going to start an immune response. It's going to be nasty. So your immune system does not talk to your nervous system on a no normal basis. Your nervous system is so highly protected that you sh not a lot of stuff can get in. But um, we do have uh, like neurons that die. So how are we going to get rid of the dead neuron debris? Well, microglial cells can gobble that up. They're phagocytic. You might have heard of things like prions, these um, things that, like mad cow disease. Microglial cells aren't obviously that great at it. It's why you can get mad cow disease, but they try. But it's just one cell against, you know, whatever can potentially get in there. So these are the, uh, we could say this is the only local immunity. And really it's the only immunity that you have in the nervous system. As soon as the immune system is introduced to like a nerve or something, whole cascade of problems about to happen. Okay, the next cells are called ependymal cells. And ependymal cells form an epithelial-like lining of our fluid-filled spaces in the brain. What the heck are you talking about, lady? Well, your brain is buoyant. Does anybody know what that means? 
it means it floats. So your brain is soft tissue and it's floating around up here in your hard cranium. The reason it doesn't go through this big hole called the foramen magnum is because of um, the cerebrospinal fluid circulating in and around it. So if you look down here at the base of your skull is this big huge hole called the foramen magnum. Your brain stem is meeting up with your spinal cord through there. The reason your brain doesn't just sink through there is because it's floating in your skull. And the reason it's floating in your skull is because of these fluid filled spaces called ventricles. And ependymal cells are the cells that line those spaces and produce cerebrospinal fluid. So ependymal cells, these are epithelial-like cells lining the fluid-filled spaces. So your central canal and your spinal cord is full of the fluid. I mean, you've got cerebrospinal fluid circulating in and around your brain. So our ependymal cells are lining all the ventricles. You can look in your book and see the whole pathway of cerebrospinal circulation. The ependymal cells are found all throughout it. Only in one spot are they forming cerebrospinal fluid. So let's talk about that in just a minute. So first we'll say they're the epithelial-like cells lining the fluid-filled spaces. They have cilia on top, and that cilia helps to beat the cerebrospinal fluid through there. Okay, so in these areas of the ventricles called choroid plexus, they are free of blood-brain barrier, and so the ependymal cells can pull everything they need to to make cerebrospinal fluid out of blood there. And so, here we go. These are your ventricles, and they are full of cerebrospinal fluid inside your brain. They are lined with ependymal cells. So all of this is just like if you fill that fluid filled space with like, what is it, like with gray plaster and then pull it out, this is what that looks like. That would all be lined with these ependymal cells. These pink regions in here are full of this stuff called choroid plexus. Choroid plexus is free of blood brain barrier. And that's the only spot that's free of blood-brain barrier. So what happens then is the ependymal cells can pull what they need to out of the blood there and make cerebrospinal fluid that then enters your ventricles. We'll talk about all of this anatomy after the first test. So I know it's kind of weird to do this way, but we're talking about tissues now. So for this first test, nervous tissue is going to be the last thing we talk about. And these fluid-filled spaces in here so we can show you this would be full of cerebrospinal fluid and that's what's going to create that buoyancy and your brain is also surrounded by the cerebrospinal fluid so it floats in your head okay so ependymal cells the other thing that we could say is a function of ependymal cells is that they form our cerebrospinal fluid which I believe when I wrote it down the first time or I mentioned the first day I'm going to forever abbreviate CSF just did it cerebrospinal fluid okay then the last type of neuroglial cell that we have in the central nervous system is called an oligodendrocyte. And oligodendrocytes are the myelinating cells of the central nervous system. And they're different than the myelinating cells of the peripheral nervous system, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And so if you look at the figure in your book, you'll see they got these weird extensions that are extending out over many neurons. And what these little things are, that's, these, these are horrible, these ones look good, is myelin sheaths. So these form what's called the myelin sheath. And you, you know of this, even if you don't know, you know of this. So you've probably all heard of MS, multiple sclerosis. So in multiple sclerosis, people have progressive loss of their ability to control their muscles. Uh, and the reason why is because they lose these myelin sheaths. What myelin sheaths do is insulate the axons of neurons so that action potentials can conduct really, really quickly. 
and what's called saltatory conduction. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So by wrapping a myelin sheath around this neuron, you can insulate it and you can have really fast signaling. If you cannot myelinate your neurons, then signaling slows down and you have a major impairment. So oligodendrocytes, they form the myelin sheath uh, in our central nervous system. So we could say these are the myelinating cells. All right. There are only two types of neural glial cells in the peripheral nervous system, satellite cells and Schwann cells, also called neural lemocytes. Schwann cells are the myelinating cells in the peripheral nervous system. And whereas one oligodendrocyte could wrap its little feet around and create a myelin sheath around several parts of one neuron or many neurons or whatever, one Schwann cell can make one myelin sheath. And we'll talk more a little about, about that in a little bit, but the picture that you probably are looking at uh, in your book, hopefully, to show you these cells in the nervous system looks something like this. And you're looking at a neuron whose cells, cell body is right there. And you have all of these satellite cells hugging around its soma or its cell body. So satellite cells cover the soma or the cell body um, of the neuron and kind of act like the barrier, the chemical barrier between this neuron then and uh, its chemical environment. So they're a little like astrocytes. And then our Schwann cells or the neurolemocytes are the myelinating cells in the PNS. And this is one, and this is one, and this is another. And what they do is they wrap themselves around and around and around and around and around the axon. Their neuron gets, or their nucleus gets pushed to the outside and they create that sheath. So what happens is that we can have really fast conduction in myelinated neurons. And not all, ne myelin not all neurons are myelinated, but a lot of them are, and if the, the faster you want a signal to be, better some sticks of myelin in there. Okay. So, what are some special characteristics of neurons? Well, the first is they display extreme longevity. You are born with neurons you're going to die with. So, the brain is different than other organs. It's got more than you need when you're born, and that way you can just cut off what you're not using. Other organs get bigger as you grow. Your brain kind of gets smaller as you grow. And so you can take advantage of that and just make sure like when you have kids, or like if you're still young, do as much with your young brain as you can. Not, and if you're old, do as much with your old brain as you can. I mean, I'm getting old and I need to start learning languages, or I'm gonna start like more languages, or I'm gonna start losing it. And why? Because that's what happens. It just cuts off over time. But they're knowing this, you can take advantage of knowing this. Like if you ever have kids, um, before they turn five for sure, but if you can get them before they turn three and start speaking a language to them, or even just like having them listen to uh, a book from the library in another language, it keeps these language neurons in their brain alive because they're learning to speak to you. So all their language neurons are active anyway. And if they're hearing other languages, then they'll be able to learn other languages easier. So it's super cool. So, but <clears throat> like if you don't use them, they're, they're gonna die off. Uh, but why, why am I yakking about all this? Because I yak all the time. Neurons display extreme longevity. You, you die with the neurons you've had since you were born. And so with the exception of a, cu a few places, neurons are amitotic. So extreme longevity, they have longer lives than most cells in your body. Most cells divide by mitosis. And so they have daughter cells or whatever, or they, and then those daughter cells, like the more times you do that, the more often daughter cells are gonna die, or a cell like becomes useless to the system or harmful to the system and it kills itself. So um, neurons really are like the exception to that rule. Like neurons are extremely long lived. So you die, with neurons you were born with. They are amitotic, A without mitosis. 
With the exception of like in your olfactory epithelium, you have some neurons there that divide by mitosis pretty readily. And like where you're deep in your brain, where you're br first bringing in memories before they get shipped off to everywhere else, in there there's some mitosis happening as well. But as a general rule, neurons are amitotic, meaning they do not divide. So when a neuron is dead, it's gone. So keep them around as long as you can. Take care of that brain. Okay. High metabolic rate. So what does this mean? They are so active. Like even at night when you think you're not doing anything, you are. You may know you are because you're dreaming or something, but your body is doing a lot of stuff. And uh, do I, I mean, yeah, but your, your nervous system is also doing a lot of stuff. There's a part of your brain that turns on to shut everything else off and those neurons are firing all night long. So all day and all night you've got neurons using a lot of energy. They have a high metabolic rate. What does this mean? They are doing stuff all the time. They are high glucose suckers. So they require a continuous supply of glucose because they are continuously busy. So we could say neurons are always active. And require a continuous supply of glucose. So we're going to see that neurons have three basic parts. Uh, the parts that are kind of receiving the signal, and then like the cell body, and then the part that's transmitting the signal. So the cell body is also called the soma, and this is where the nucleus is. So this is like where the brain of the neuron is. So a cell body is a soma. And if we find groups of somas together in the central nervous system, we call that a nucleus or plural nuclei. So nuclei are groups of somas in the central nervous system. Well, what am I talking about? So like we'll say, oh, these things are released from hypothalamic nuclei. Those are the clusters of cell bodies in the hypothalamus where we can find those somas. Okay, so groups of somas in the CNS are found in nuclei, and then groups of somas in the PNS are found in those ganglia we talked about. So ganglia are groups of somas in the CNS. And we can actually see I actually brought this model home because we can see some ganglia on it. So if you look, oh, I hope you can see it. I'm gonna pull it out and you can. So if you look here, when you come just outside the spinal cord, you have that enlarged region here, kind of see it through there. Those are these clusters of cell bodies uh, for our sensory neurons that are coming in. So yeah, they're enlarged right there because we've got all their somas there. And then their axons are shooting out um, into the, well, it's the, yeah, out to the sensory receptor. Uh, and there are other axons running in there. We'll talk about that more for the next test. So that's the first thing to be aware of. The next thing to be aware of is axons then. These are, the parts of the neuron that are sending the action potential. So these conduct the nerve impulse or the action potential. I'm gonna call the, I'm gonna abbreviate it AP, action potential. Your book calls it the nerve impulse. I'm not gonna write it a bunch, I'll do it this time. But um, our axon is going to conduct the nerve impulse or conduct the action potential. Groups of axons in the CNS are found in tracts. So groups of axons in the CNS are found in tracts. And groups of axons in the PNS are found in nerves. Groups of axons in PNS are found in nerves. Cool. 
All right, so the other part of a neuron is going to be attached to the soma on the opposite side of the axon. So f a leading away from the soma will have an axon that's going to conduct our action potential away from the soma. And then coming onto it, we have these things called dendrites. So I'm going to leave this orange here for you because it might help. And we'll do dendrites in purple. Dendrites are these uh, like receptive segments that come onto the soma and they're going to be receptive to a stimulus coming from the axon of another neuron. So these are the receptive, uh, uh, yeah, extensions of the neuron. I'll say the receptive extensions, no, yeah, receptive extensions of the neuron coming onto the soma. And we'll draw this in a minute. Okay. So the axon. The axon is the big thing that's going to conduct this action potential or this nerve impulse. What does it look like? What's its function? Its function is to conduct the action potential. But its structure is that it's got this enlarged region that's leading away from the soma. So let's just go ahead and draw ourselves a neuron. So let's say this is our soma. It's got my nucleus here. So it's the brain of the cell, this is my soma, or the cell body. Leading away from the soma, I have my axon. This is what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about right now. It's got a toll on slide. So leading away from it, I've got an axon. And that axon has an enlarged region here called the axon hillock. That's its anatomical name. And the axon is going to extend away from the neuron, or the, from the soma of the neuron. And then it might branch into these terminal segments called telodendria. And they have these enlarged regions called axon terminals or synaptic knobs. So structure of the axon, axon hillock. And then this is like the, which we could also call the initial segment because this is where we're going to initially generate that action potential. And then we've got the conductive segment that's going to conduct the action potential to the last part, the transmissive segment that's going to transmit that message now into neurotransmitter. So it's an electrical potential coming through here and will cause that to release a neurotransmitter that now becomes a chemical signal that will bind on to the next neuron. So, okay, those, that's the structure. We've got an initial segment, a conductive segment, and a transmissive segment. Down here are these little branches. All of these branches are called telodendria. And then these enlarged regions right here are called synaptic knobs, is how I learned it. They used to, I think before then, they called it an axon bouton. Now, I think your book's calling it an axon terminal. I tend to call it a synaptic knob. All of the acceptable names are acceptable. So just call it something that's appropriate. Uh, don't call it late for dinner. That probably wasn't funny. I always think I'm a lot funnier than other people, I'm sure. All right, so the function is going to be to conduct an action potential. So the axon conducts action potentials. And it does it because of the channels that it has in it. So we're actually going to look at the structure of an axon in a lot greater detail. We're going to look at the microanatomy of an axon in a little bit. Uh, we're actually, yeah, we're going to talk about like What's happening? Never mind. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. So the other thing to be aware of is that the axon is this region that will contain our myelin sheath. So if you see that in a neuron that's myelinated, 
you wouldn't see the axon in here because it would be covered by this myelin sheath that's insulating the neuron. And then these little gaps in here have a couple different names. Your book's calling it a neurofibril node, I believe, but they're also called nodes of Ranvier. So they're trying to get rid of all the dead scientist names. Ron Vier is the dead scientist name, so I should get on board. I'm stuck in the past and the future, it sucks. Uh, so they're also called neurofibril nodes. <laughs> and what happens in myelinated neurons is the action potential appears to jump from node to node to node. It doesn't quite, it's, but that's what it looks like and it makes it super fast. So uh, myelin sheaths insulate neurons so that it can, protects the integrity of the charge in there. It's pretty cool. All right, that's the structure of the axon. Oh, look, I told you about the myelin sheath already. Okay, now, if we think about what's going on as far as the way that all of these different kind of mm, extensions can come onto or off of the neuron, then we are going to classify our neurons based on that structurally and then we'll also classify them based on what kind of information they're carrying or we'll classify them functionally. So the first method that we're going to use is what do they look like, their structure. So multipolar neurons are the most abundant, most abundant, most important. This is going to be what we use as our model of a neuron is a multipolar neuron. Uh, we'll talk about the specific places that we find the other two types um, in general right now and then specifically when we get there. But for a multipolar neuron, it's called multipolar because it's got it's many sides. It's sure, it's one-sided here. Only one axon leads away. Yes, that axon might branch, but you never have more than one axon coming off of a soma. What might happen is you might have many dendrites coming onto it. And then you have many poles. So multipolar neurons have more than one dendrite, but they'll only ever have one axon. And you only ever have one soma. Okay. I'm just going to write the next two types on their own lines. So the next type uh, by structural classification is called bipolar. Bi means two. So bipolar neurons have two poles. So here's their soma, and everybody always has one axon leading away. So there's one pole. And then we only have one dendrite or one like thing coming onto it. It might have a few little receptive endings, but we've got one dendrite and one axon. This is how I'm going to draw my axons from now on. Even if they are like in a neuron who has lots of telodendria, I'm not going to draw that every time. I'm just going to draw like, and you'll know that that is a synaptic knob or an axon terminal is this enlarged region down here. And we'll talk more about what we find in there in a little bit. Okay, so in bipolar neurons, we have one dendrite leading onto the soma and one axon extending away from the soma. And then the last type we have by structural classification is a unipolar neuron. And in a unipolar neuron, you have one extension coming off of the soma that is gonna quickly branch into two segments. So, and that was what we see in those sensory neurons and those ganglia we've been talking about. Those are unipolar. So they've got one thing coming off the soma and it quickly branches into this long axon that has little receptive endings. And this part of the axon is what we call the peripheral process. The peripheral process is in contact with a sensory receptor out in the periphery. So the sensory receptor is going to detect some change and quickly shoot an action potential along this sense, well, this unipolar neuron. In this case, the one I'm talking about, the sensory neuron um, that we find in <laughs> bringing in information from our skin. It'll shoot it back and then that information is going to conduct on the next part of it which is the central process. So this is the central process, and the central process is going to bring the information into the CNS. 
So in the case of general sensory information, that'll come into the spinal cord and shoot up to the brain, um, brain stem or something like that. We'll talk more about that later. Um, for the special senses, it's gonna shoot through and back. We'll talk more about that when we get to our next test. So those are our three types of neurons by structural classification. And these are gonna be the most common. So this is the kind I'm gonna use for all of our drawings from here on out. And so where do we find each of these? Well, yeah, let's talk about Let's just, I'm actually going to just erase this stuff over here and leave these definitions up so that we can see the ways that we lay structure and function onto each other. So the functional way, if you zoom ahead in your PowerPoint, you'll see it says functional, our functional classification of neurons, sensory and motor. So I'm just going to write that stuff over here. Our functional classification is how we're going to functional classification is what we're talking about next and we're going to call them either sensory neurons or motor neurons or actually interneurons so there are three types by functional classification so when we're talking about them by function is what kind of information are they carrying sensory neurons only carry sensory information only carry sensory info okay so like these guys that i've been talking about these unipolar neurons we find these like as our general sensory neurons bringing in general sensory information from your body so that's an example we could say of laying it together we have unipolar sensory neurons that bring in information about your sense of touch or something like that okay <clears throat> next our motor neurons are only going to carry motor information so motor neurons only carry motor info another way we can think about this is they only carry efferent information and our sensory neurons only carry afferent information my card ran out and I just kept yakking and yakking in the interest of not driving myself batty I'm not going to write this all again I'm going to tell you what I said so motor neurons carry only motor information most of them are multipolar neurons so they'll have their somas clustered together in the central nervous system somewhere and uh, be shooting their axons out in nerves in the peripheral nervous system then those neurons running in those nerves are going to synapse onto some effector to bring about some change so for a functional class of neurons our sensory neurons are carrying only afferent sensory information into the central nervous system our motor neurons are carrying only efferent or motor information away from the central nervous system so then the third type of neuron that we have by functional classification is an interneuron and our interneurons are wholly encased in the central nervous system 100 percent in, in the spinal cord or in the brain so the brain is made of interneurons and those interneurons are the middlemen between our sensory and motor neurons okay so they communicate between sensory and motor neurons they are totally encased in the central nervous system and they also tend to be mostly multipolar so how can I bring all of this stuff together? Well, I could think like, okay, if I touch something painful, a sensory receptor, a nocio receptor is gonna feel that. I'm gonna quickly shoot an action potential along this unipolar uh, sensory neuron. That's going to synapse onto a multipolar interneuron. That interneuron is going to synapse. It's gonna have teledendria. It's gonna be a multipolar interneuron and it's gonna those teledendria are gonna branch and synapse onto other interneurons that are gonna take some information up to your brain because you're aware of what's going on but then one of these teledendria is gonna synapse right onto a motor neuron that's gonna take an in th this efferent command out to your skeletal muscle that says move away from that painful stimulus okay 
And then other inner neurons are going to carry information up to your brain so that you're aware of it as well. That's what gives you awareness. But the movement part was totally controlled by the inner neurons in your spinal cord. So be aware of that. So by functional class, um, sensory neurons are either bipolar or unipolar. Most of our motor neurons and inner neurons are multipolar. Other things to be aware of. This is where it starts getting hard. So hang on a minute and I'm going to get a drink and make sure our frame is good. So before we move into the hard part and get into the physiology, I thought I would talk about the just like bring all of the anatomy together that's going to lead to the physiology. And then what we're going to wrap up with today is some quick definitions and an like very general idea of the types of potentials that we can do in a neuron. And next class, we're going to pick up with the nitty gritty details of how we get an action potential, how it conducts down the axon, what's going to happen as a result of that. And then we'll finish up by talking about summation of action potentials, which is how we're going to get an action potential. It's kind of weird, but it's the order the book goes in. So we'll just go with it. Hopefully it'll, it, well, it's not hopefully it will all make sense by the end of it. I promise. So quickly, I just wanted to review. So we talked about our structural and our fun functional classifications of our neurons. So let's think about a multipolar neuron. These are the most abundant and we're going to use this as kind of our basis for understanding neurons. And so what are the different anatomical structures that are going to lead to the physiology? So the dendrites here and the soma are those two parts. And what they are going to do is compose what we call the receptive segment. So this part of the neuron is receptive to a stimulus. So the dendrites and the soma are the receptive segment. And uh, we're just going to kind of put this in our back pocket for now and talk about the details of all of this next time. But the more you see it, the better off you'll be, the less confusing it will be. So in the receptive segment, this part is receptive to a stimulus. And so we have some channels here. The only channels that we find in the receptive segment are chemically gated channels. So they're going to open when a chemical binds. When a neurotransmitter is released from the terminal segment or from the transmissive segment of a neuron up here, it will cross and bind to the receptive segment on the next neuron. So if this is this neuron's receptive segment, it has chemically gated channels. So we'll say it contains chemically gated channels. It's the only part of the neuron that contains chemically gated channels. That's going to be important. Each part of the neuron is going to be able to behave differently depending on what types of channels it has. And in the receptive segment, we only have chemically gated channels. Okay. The axon now kind of has three different parts. The axon hillock, which is the initial segment where we'll generate, like, can, like we're going to decide if we're going to trigger an action potential. The conductive segment where we conduct that action potential. And then the transmissive segment where we transmit that electrical signal into a neurotransmitter signal. So for different parts, we could say this part right here is called the initial segment or the trigger zone, because this is where we're going to be able to trigger an action potential. This part right here is the conductive segment. And this is because this is the segment along which we are conducting this action potential. And then this last part down here is the transmissive segment. And this is where we are transmitting or yeah, we're transmitting our message to the next neuron and we're converting it from an electrical signal here into a chemical signal here. So as far as channels go, the channels are, are going to determine the behavior. So it's important to start wrapping our head around this. These are just proteins 
that we stick in a membrane and they have no choice but to behave the way they do. So when you're reading ahead for next class, make sure that you think about that. So in the initial segment and the conductive segment, the two types of channels that we find, well, are, they're only voltage-gated channels, but there are voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels. So what we'll say for this portion of the axon is that as this portion contained chemically-gated channels, the receptive segment had chemically-gated channels, the axon um, in the initial segment and in the conductive segment is going to have voltage-gated channels, and in particular, the ones that are important in the action potential here are the voltage-gated sodium channel and the voltage-gated potassium channel. Now, when we get to the transmissive segment of the axon, or the axon terminal, the synaptic knob, we still have voltage-gated channels, but they're voltage-gated calcium channels. So here, this contains voltage-gated channels as well but now they're calcium. So Ca2 plus is calcium. So I will from now on abbreviate calcium as C or Ca2 plus. N is sodium. Why? N, sodium starts with an S. It's true, but the ion for sodium is Na plus. So a voltage-gated sodium channel is a VGNC. Be aware of that. And a voltage-gated potassium channel is a VGKC. Why? Because potassium is, uh, as an ion is K+. Plus. The things that are moving through these channels are ions, and that's what we're going to find. So put all that stuff in your back pocket, because this is going to be... We're going to move now to our, some general definitions and we're going to talk about graded potentials that we generate here. Action potentials are co covered here. So it'll just help to kind of think about how this anatomy is going to relate to the physiology because the physiology is about to get really real, people. So membrane potentials. Go back and read chapter 3.5. If you need a review of membrane potentials, this should have been taught to you in your general bio class as we discussed in our cell lecture. So if you don't feel comfortable with membrane potentials, go back and look at it. You probably don't because most people aren't. We're going to have a basic review about, of membrane potentials right now. And then we're going to talk about changing this potential because that's what neurons are doing. That's what's unique about neurons as cells is that they're able to use this resting membrane potential to do something. So like all cells, chapter 3.5, neurons are cells. They have a resting membrane potential. So what, is, what does this mean? This is a charge separation across the membrane that we can measure. It's a potential because it's potential energy. If we move these charges closer to each other, then we can release energy. So, all right, we can measure that. So, unlike most other cells, Neurons can do something with this membrane potential. Neurons contain voltage-gated channels that can respond to differences in voltage so that we can change the voltage. So all cells have resting membrane potentials. Unlike most other cells, neurons contain voltage-gated channels, or we'll say contain gated channels, that allow for the membrane potential to change. So our neurons contain gated channels that allow for the membrane potential to change. What do I mean? Well, we've got chemically gated channels that are going to allow ions to move in and it's going to change what we can measure the difference that we measure across that membrane. We're going to have voltage-gated channels that are going to open and allow ions to flow, and we're going to change that potential that we measure across the membrane. So that won't be rest anymore because we'll be moving away from rest. Not all cells can move away from rest, but neurons can, muscle cells can. They're pretty cool, so just be aware of that. Now we're going to talk about how we can move away really next time, but we're going to go over some basic principles right now so that you can start thinking about it. If we slam it all into one ne lecture next time, you will be too overwhelmed. So as far as basic principles of electricity go, 
We're going to go over some very basic definitions. Electricity is physics under the control of chemistry. I mean, all sciences are united. And they're all cool, like at that level when they're united. But man, when you get into the like nitty gritty of like calculating like voltages and like in physics and like moles and chemistry, ugh, that is not my jam. <laughs> so we will only ever look at physics and chemistry as much as we need to to understand our amazing physiology. So we're not going to go into the nitty gritty details of all of these definitions. But we have to have some basic understanding because I am going to talk to you and say, oh, well, sodium is going to move to its equilibrium potential of positive 30 millivolts. So if you don't understand what voltage is, then that doesn't make any sense to you. So a voltage is, it's like a charge that we can measure. It's a separation of charge across the membrane is going to create this potential difference and we can measure that. So a voltage we could say is a measure of separation of charge across our membrane. I mean, that's probably not at all close to the physical definition. Like if you ask a physicist what's voltage, he's going to give you an equation. If you ask an anatomist what's voltage, I'm going to say it's the charge that we measure in our neurons and our, in our muscle cells. So you, and that may sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do. <laughs> like our, all of our cells are bathed in extra, extracellular fluid, which has a whole bunch of sodium out here and a whole bunch of chloride out here and a whole bunch of calcium out here. We've got a whole bunch of potassium in here. And there's a whole bunch of negative ions in here. And they're all like gathered here close to the plasma membrane and sodium's attracted to that. Potassium's also attracted to that. So these things are kind of hanging out here next to this negative charge. Like I get it and you need to get it to that level. So <laughs> it's a measure like it's, we can measure this. So what happens in our neurons is we stick a voltmeter in here and we see, okay, relative to out here inside our neuron at rest is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so the resting membrane of potential of our neurons is negative 70 millivolts. We'll see that different cells have different resting membrane potentials and that is going to be set by the, the amount of potassium leak channels that they have. So we're going to go over all of that stuff next time. Maybe now. I don't want to go over it now. I'm tired. But anyway, wah, 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 voltage, the measure of this charge across a membrane. And since we're separating this charge, it gives us a potential. There's a potential of energy to be gained here. That's why it's called a resting membrane potential. So we can measure the potential of energy to be gained here, and it changes throughout various phases of what's going on. Okay, current is the movement. <clears throat> of a charge or the flow of a charge in this case the flow of ions so the flow of sodium into the cell and then the flow of potassium out of the cell those are causing a current or a movement of charge so our current in the body is the flow of ions and so chemists would call this charge and they would probably also give you a fancy equation, which is why I don't like chemistry, honestly, is because of all the equations. And it's not that I don't like equations. I like equations on their own. I just don't like them mixed up with science. I mean, sometimes, but not in moles and not in, this isn't even chemistry. This is physics. So there you go. Equations in science. I don't want them. Okay. Basic principles of electricity. What do we care about? What are we going to talk about? Why does any of this matter? Well, because we are going to look at the movement of sodium and potassium into and out of our neurons and the change in the potential that occurs as that happens resulting in this action potential. That's how we can conduct an electrical signal in the body is move these tiny little charged particles into and out of cells. So, okay, role of membrane ion channels. Channels are large proteins that select, uh, that serve to have, give some selective control over what can come into and out of the cell. The potassium ion channel or ion channels are only going to allow potassium through. 
Uh, we've got two different, like, sodium ion channels only allow sodium through, calcium channels only calcium through, cation channels let potassium and sodium through. So each ion channel you're looking at is going to be different and different ions are going to go through it. We've got two main types, either leakage channels that are always open, leakage or, oh, or non-gated channels are always open, leakage, non-gated channels, which are always open. So I'm just going to draw a little cell up here and let's just throw in a, a leak channel and a couple leak channels and <clears throat> let's say this first one is a potassium leak channel. Where's potassium higher, in or out of the cell? In. So if you open a channel and potassium leaks down its concentration gradient, which way is it going to go, in or out of the cell? out it's going to leak from high in to low out so let's say this is a potassium leak channel so this is just a potassium leak channel and what happens through here is potassium leaks out that is a positive charge leaving the cell all of our negative proteins that give the cell a negative charge can't leave the cell so as potassium leaves, it makes the cell more negative because potassium is positive. Positive charge leaving makes you more negative. Okay, well, we also have sodium leak channels. There are fewer sodium leak channels. So, but what it does is allow sodium to leak down its concentration gradient. So where is sodium higher? Outside the cell. So where's it gonna leak? into the cell. So sodium is Na plus. So this is our sodium leak channel. And what's going to happen through here is sodium is going to leak in. So if potassium ruled the day, it would leak out until negative 90. And then we'd be at potassium's electrochemical equilibrium. And that would be it. But we throw in these the sodium leak channels, if sodium was in charge, it would pull it all the way to positive 30. So if we bring back in some positive, we're going to come away from negative 90 and back up to negative 70 in our neurons. So, okay, potassium channels then have the largest impact on resting membrane potential. And it's these leakage channels, and they're always open. The second type of channel that we have are gated channels. And there are three types of gated channels. Gated channels, it's just like, it's just like it sounds. It's got some kind of gate, and when the gate is closed, nothing's moving through it. But if the gate is open, ah, then an ion can come through there. So how can we open gates? We can open gates with chemical keys, or with voltage keys, or with physical keys. We're not going to talk about physical keys with neurons right now. Physical keys are more in like sensory receptors. So if you feel in a vibration like or pressure, you're touching a physical key that's it, it, oh, well, you're activating a physical key that's opening a gate. So the two that we're going to talk about in neurons are chemically gated keys. <laughs> Our I had a little, little, little bleep, bleep. The two that we're talking about in neurons are chemically gated channels where the key to open the gate is a neurotransmitter and voltage gated channels where the key to open the channel or the gate is a specific voltage. Okay, so we'll talk about those when we get to sensory receptors. Let's move forward. So chemically gated channels open when a specific chemical binds to the receptor or to the channel. So open when a specific, this is huge. So it has to be specific chemical binds. So I can't dump acetylcholine on a norepinephrine receptor and expect anything to happen. I can dump acetylcholine onto an acetylcholine receptor and I can open a chemically gated channel that's going to allow for the movement of ions. We'll talk more about that later, okay? 
So open when a specific chemical binds. A fancy word for chemical is ligand. So you could also see these as ligand-gated receptors. Okay, voltage-gated channels open in response to a specific voltage. So these open in response to voltage changes. So you're sitting at negative 70. If you move away from 70 and you open a channel at like negative 55, let's say you get to negative 55, you're going to open your voltage gated channels and now ions are going to move down their concentration gradient through those channels. And then mechanically gated channels open in response to some kind of physical perturbation. Perturbation is like disturbance. So it, when you feel something brush along the surface of your skin, it's a mechanically gated channel that's opening. So these open in response to physical perturbation. Okay, so I'm going to leave you off with some basic definitions to think about and guide your reading and your studies before next class. Resting membrane potential is the, the, the potential that you can measure when a cell is doing nothing at rest. In neurons, it's negative 70 millivolts. And so resting membrane potential, I'm going to always abbreviate as RMP, and this is for neurons. And this is going to be different for different cells. We'll see it's negative 90 in skeletal muscle cells. We've got some cardiac cells that are at negative 60, other ones that are at negative 90. And the reason that it's going to be different from cell to cell is because we have differing numbers of those leak channels. So if the potassium leak channel was the only thing that was allowed to rule the day, potassium would leak out until negative 90 millivolts. And because, and then at that point, it would be repelled by the sodium positive charge that's attracted right here, and we'd reach our electrochemical equilibrium and we'd be done. But potassium's not the only one ruling the day. So we can stick in a sodium leak channel, and sodium is going to leak down its concentration gradient into the cell. The differing number of these channels is what's going to change this. So in our, so just be aware of that. So in here, we're going to allow enough sodium to leak into the neuron that it gets us to negative 70 millivolts. If these two things were the only things that were in control, then we'd really, we would reach chemical equilibrium and we wouldn't have a difference in concentration across the membrane to do anything with. So the thing that is keeping our concentration gradient different is the sodium potassium pump. And this is another thing that I talked about when we were talking about active transport. I wasn't going to go over the nitty gritty details of this again because I'm not. This is active transport where what we're doing is we are actively transporting three sodium out against its concentration gradient so that we can keep it higher out there and actively pumping two potassium in against its concentration gradient so we can get more potassium in there. These three things set resting membrane potential. So resting membrane potential is determined by all of these things. All cells have these things. Neurons have all three of these things at every single part. The transmissive segment, this conductive segment, the receptive segment, all of it. I'm not going to talk about these anymore, but if I ask you to list all of the channels and pumps in a neuron and you don't give me these, you're going to lose points because they're there. And now you're expected to know that they're there and they are setting our resting membrane potential. What neurons are going to do now is stick different channels in different parts of the neuron so that we can change this potential and do different stuff. That's what's so, so, so cool. So how are we going to do different stuff? We're going to change our resting, we're going to move away from our resting membrane potential and we're going to do it in two ways, by generating graded potentials or action potentials. This is what we're going to talk about next time, but I will just want to give you some basic definitions right now so that you know what's going on and where they're going on and how it relates to what we learned. Graded potentials occur in the receptive segment. Graded means that they're like, it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They're graded, so they're different. So graded potentials are only occurring in the receptive segment, and they're all being added up to decide if we're going to fire an action potential. So
So what we could say about graded potentials is that they vary in strength. They uh, decay over time and space. They add or, well, we're going to say they sum together to determine if we'll fire an action potential. So what I'm going to say is uh, they are, they'll sum together to determine if an AP is fired. And graded potentials only occur in the receptive segment. These are short distance and they're cool, but not as cool as an action potential. <clears throat> Why? Because action potentials do not vary in strength. They are the same magnitude every time. And as soon as you start one, it is going to go down the entire length of the axon without decrement. It is so cool. So they um, are long distance signals. They do not vary in strength. They are all or none phenomenon. You are either get it or you don't. So you can't get a little bit of an action potential. If you start it, you're getting all of it, which is really cool. Um, what else do we want to say? These are occurring in the, they're starting in the initial segment. They're conducting down the length of the axon. And then in the transmissive segment, the action potential is kind of over. And the, the action potential is going to open those chemically gated calcium channels in the transmissive segment. So what we could say is these occur in, or will they start in the initial segment? And I actually want to change this. And self-propagate down the conductive segment. That means they regenerate themselves the entire length of the conductive segment. And they're able to do that because of our voltage gated channels, which is what we're going to talk about next time. So put those definitions of our potentials in your back pocket. Then I'm going to give you some quick definitions of how we move away from our resting membrane potentials and leave you to think on all of that before next class. So how do we change or move away from rest? If we move away from the resting membrane potential, in this case our neurons are sitting at negative 70, in the positive direction, then that's depolarization. And you can think about this, if this is our membrane and it's keeping us polarized, meaning that we have different sides, this is the negative side inside the cell, this is the positive side outside here, if we become more positive, we depolarize. These are our poles and so if we become more positive in here, we are taking away this polarization. So depolarization moves you away from rest in the positive direction. I'm going to say that's what I do. I'm depolarizing. I just came up with that. Repolarization is going to be what brings us back toward rest. polarization is going to make this pole even bigger. So if we're sitting here at negative 70, hyperpolarization is going to make us like a negative 80, negative 90. It's going to make this pole even bigger. So hyperpolarization happens when you move away from rest in the negative direction. So this moves away from rest in the negative direction. Okay.
So, take a breath, put all of your, that in your back pocket, read over graded potentials and action potentials, study hard, and let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you in the Teachers Helping Students Succeed discussion page. And yeah, have fun. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get through this one time and copy it over, because this is hard. Okay, <laughs> so. <sighs> breathe in, supraspinatus. Breathe out, adducts. Oh. <laughs>